Hi, and welcome to the presentation tonight. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, tonight's presentation is going to be fall fly fishing in Pennsylvania. Um, I'm happy to have Derek Eberly with me. And uh, my name is Dave Kyle from PA Fly Fish. Uh, I'll do a, some introductions here. We'll switch out of our uh, opening slide and jump over to a few, few slides that uh, Derek has put together for us. And I think we only have about five or 10 slides in total, not a real lot. A lot of it's just be some conversation with Derek. We'll get done well before eight o'clock, but we'll also make sure we get done in enough time to uh, ask some questions. So a couple of ways we can do that during the presentation, there's a chat message area that you can probably see in your control panel that you can type something in. Or if you wanna wait till the end, uh, we can call on you and we can uh, jump into a question verbally that way. At if you could please do me a favor during the presentation and make sure your microphones are muted, it'd probably be a little bit easier for us all. So we'll go from there. So let me just jump over and let's get started with uh, our opening slides and uh, introduction to Derek. <clears throat> all right, Derek, we have that going. It looks pretty sweet. Uh, oh, look at that, there's a timer. That's awesome. Is it really? Oh, yeah, cool. you, you've got me uh, you've got me on the clock. On the clock. Well, Derek, thanks for thanks for joining me. Derek, I, I Derek and I fished uh, last winter at Big Spring Creek and we were chatting about trying to figure out some more time to get together and we we didn't pull it off. We tried to get together in May, with the Green Drake Hatch. But I talked to Derek this past summer and said, Hey, would you help me out? How would you be you know, interested in talking about? some fall fly fishing as we get started. And um, we're shortly, that's shortly upon us here. And um, Derek, wanna tell us a bit about yourself, some of your background? Sure, sure. Uh, so my name is Derek Eberly. I live in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So I'm down here in the Southeastern, South Central part of the state. I've uh, been fly fishing since 2001. Um, my best friend got me into it. We have some really great spring creeks around here. Um, so I, I cut my teeth on those and then uh, spent a lot of time um, going up to north central Pennsylvania and uh, central Pennsylvania uh, through my late 20s. And then in uh, 2013, I decided that, uh, you know, I had done a couple uh, learn to fly fish classes. I had helped with our Trout Unlimited chapter. And I just I decided that, uh, you know, I enjoyed that so much, enjoyed sharing fly fishing with people so much that uh, I wanted to start my own guide service. So I started my own guide service in 2013. Um, also wanted to really just learn how to cast better, but also learn how to help people cast better. So I went to the Wolf School and did their uh, instructor's course. Um, and I've been a certified casting instructor through the w Wolf School since 2014, um, working on my uh, FFI CI, which is a casting instructor certification um, through the Federation of Fly Fishers International. Um, and then Work, life, family really uh, started to catch up with me this past year. And um, I had a really great opportunity um, to join Sky Blue Outfitters uh, this past spring. Uh, so I'm working through Sky Blue Outfitters as well. I still do casting tournaments from time to time, although those have slowed down the last two years. So that's a little bit about me. Cool. Um, just a real quick question. Are we seeing multiple slides up there or just a single deck slide i'm single seeing deck. multiple slides with yeah, the top okay that's right. i'm feeling really pressured dave okay all right <laughs> I'll, I'll switch it down to this sorry I, it's a thing with my presentation software so i'll just put it down this way here you're all um, uh so i'm dave kyle uh for those of you who are not familiar with me i'm uh, founder of pa flyfish started that little over 25 years ago. Um, currently been working on that site is probably my main thing in, in fly fishing, although I've been fly fishing for 35 years and hoping for those of you who are actively involved in the site that in the next few months we'll be updating the software. And at that point, um, do some transition stuff about moving off the old platform to a new platform for a variety of reasons. And I'll keep people posted on the site um, uh, about what's happening with that. If you're not familiar with PA Fly Fish, it's a community of anglers, mostly in the Pennsylvania region, although we have fly fishing anglers from all over the country, um, Florida and <laughs> out west and all kinds of places. So it's a place where we convene to share ideas and topics, but also where we also connect to get together and meet up at times as well. So um, thanks for joining us this evening and we'll keep things moving forward with 
Derek, want to help us out a little bit with uh, some of the, the trout fall behavior? Sure, sure. Um, so, you know, moving into fall, we're coming out of summer, we're coming out of high temperatures. Um, and again, first, let me just say, uh, this is, these are just some of the things that I've observed, uh, heard, observed, um, you know, discussed with other people. You might have uh, different experiences uh, as well, and I certainly welcome you to share those um, at, the end of, at the end of this or uh, in the chat box. But, um, you know, one of the first things I start to think about this time of year is that the trout are moving. So I think about movement, um, you know, where they're headed, what they're looking for, um, cover and food, obviously, but they're also looking for uh, spawning ground um, and returning to the tributaries uh, for the fish that do move. A lot of them are returning to the tributaries where they were introduced, or uh, if it's wild fish, where they were, um, where they were, what do you, what do you, what is it, uh, birthed? They're not birthed. They come from eggs. Hatched. Uh, hatched. Yeah. Geez, why did that escape me right now? That was great. Um, where they where they hatched. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes words just escape me. Anyways, um, so they're moving, and, and that's something to think about. Um, you know, uh, they're look, leaving the thermal refuges of uh, summer, looking for their spawning grounds, and uh, also, um, I like to say that, uh, uh, you know, in the early morning, evening uh, are also obviously uh, good times to, to target those fish and uh, watch for them to come out and start to move. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, you know, when you're thinking about um, uh, behavior of trout, you know, I, I notice that I feel like they're more aggressive in the fall, pre-spawn. Um, they're more, uh, oftentimes I think more uh, inclined to chase a streamer, which is really exciting for me. It's something that I really like, uh, like to fish with. Um, and uh, it doesn't always have to be a big streamer either. Um, it can be uh, what I call like five weight streamers, which are, you know, guys that are, you know, what, like uh, two inches or, you know, even an inch and a half small uh, streamers, um, bait fish size streamers. Um, although you certainly can cast uh, the big articulated uh, streamers that, you know, I'm not saying that the fish aren't eating them because they're hungry, but sometimes they're, uh, they're attacking those uh, flies because they're aggressive and they don't want another fish in their area um, as they're, as they're moving up or maybe as they're uh, starting to find their area where they want to spawn. So um, when looking for likely um, areas for that fish are moving, you know, look, analyze watersheds, look for impoundments and tributaries. Um, look for lakes, reservoirs, dams, ponds, et cetera, big bodies of water where fish might be moving out of and heading upstream. So, you know, I can think of a couple, uh, couple watersheds in, in Pennsylvania where you have uh, nice impoundments that uh, fish sometimes go out into big, deep lakes and they summer down in the cooler temps. And then here in the fall, they're headed up and, and moving into tributaries. Um, and also look for, for watersheds that uh, in the headwaters have good uh, gravelly areas for fish to spawn. But, you know, again, you don't really want to fish for those of you that are, that are new, newer to this, you don't really want to fish. You don't want to fish over uh, spawning fish. Uh, if you see fish that are paired up over a red and a red's pretty easy to identify, it's, it's a really clean uh, area of gravel. You'll, you'll know it when you see it. It's, they're very, usually very obvious. If you see fish sitting over that, uh, you just want to leave them alone. Yeah. So when when would you more than likely see spawning activity occur, and how long? What period of time are you going to see that? Well, it's gonna it's gonna um, it's kind of different in across the state. You know, I think some some folks will say you know it's this certain week of you know October or November or whatever you know. Um, but I think you actually see different watersheds uh, across the state because you know we have different uh, climates across the state. Um, I think you, you see different watersheds start to, generally speaking, um, you know, I start to really make sure that I'm keeping an, an eye out in, a, in like mid-October uh, down here. I'm, I'm just making sure that I'm, I'm keeping my eyes open and, and looking for reds or looking for fish that are paired up. So what would be the characteristics of a, uh, of a trout or trout, oh, trout oh, over top of a red? Here it's weeding. Thank there. you. Yes, um, paired up trout. So you know, on the spring creeks around here that I fish the most, you'll see uh, you'll see like I said, a really clean gravel bed, and then you'll see 
pretty clearly two brown <laughs> trout. <laughs> but you'll see uh, trout for a chicken for a doggy. really clear uh, oh. gravel areas. Getting a little, uh, getting a oh. little feedback from someone. Yeah. Hey, uh, can we make sure that you please have your uh, microphones muted? I think we have someone who's got an open mic. Did that answer your question, though, Dave? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I've, the times I've seen it, I, mean, I think I was on Spring Creek, and I most recognize it there. You got, you know, maybe darker gravel with a smaller um, circle of um, lighter looking gravel that I recognize as being where there's, you know, a fish, a trout over top of that. And it's because the trout are trying to move that gravel around and make sure they have a place to spawn over top of that and protect the eggs. Um, so do brown trout, brook trout, and rainbow trout spawn all at the same time? No. Um, so you're going to have, uh, well, that's actually, I'm sure people will, uh, will bash me. There's exceptions to the rule, but go there's ahead. There's exceptions, yes, because there's, I believe it's the rainbows that uh, using like light therapy, they've gotten uh, rainbows to adjust and spawn at different times. But, you know, essentially what you're looking at is uh, brook and brown trout uh, spawning right now. Um, generally, uh, rainbows would spawn more, um, you know, in the spring. Um, but it's kind of a, you can kind of get into a crapshoot uh, with uh, different different fish in PA, depending on where they. So the general rule is um, fall, we need to look out for spawning trout they're, they're the area they have that we need to look out for are reds doesn't mean we can't fish near those trout we just need to make sure we're not stepping on those reds where they've spawned over top up right yeah and i i mean for for fishing wise too like i would really just discourage people from casting over a red like if you see fish on a clear nice clean gravelly red or, or paired up um yeah they're going to be like i I don't think it's a secret they're going to be pretty aggressive um so if you chuck a streamer at them you could you know potentially get a, a response but that's kind of uh it's, it's more or less uh unethical and you don't really want to be doing that that's, yeah there's, uh, there's a few streams out there you can i would say spring creek and big spring creek or places i've been to that the reds are kind of obvious and you can see the trout over top of them and you want to be mindful of that so there's that's a good point cool all right should we go on the next slide yeah, let's go to the next slide. Okay. Are right, we already covered that? That, I, that was my, my movement uh, shtick. All right, that's cool. But to recap, yeah. We're there moving you. quickly through it now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the aggression uh, uh, bit there. Uh, trout are aggress aggressive, great time for streamers. Examples being woolly buggers, zonkers, sculpins. Bucktail, bucktail patterns on the swing can be a lot of fun too. If you swing like a brace of wet flies, that could be fun. That worked on, uh, I was fishing the Poa Poco one time and I was swinging a brace of uh, bucktails. It was awesome. Nothing big, but lots of fun uh, little guys. What time were you, is there any preference to what time you're swinging? Um, something like that? Uh, um, it a it wood bugger? Just, yeah, it was, it was like mid morning. Um, when I had my good experience there, but I don't, I wouldn't say that that's like the only time that you could do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think because that presentation is kind of like a really slow, just chill, you know, I, I don't know, in my head, I kind of feel like the fish feel like how I feel. And I'm always kind of like slow in the morning. So I don't know. It's like a real laid back way to present, but I, I bet it would work any time of the day. So if you were going to take out one, you know, kind of pattern that you're talking about right here, what would be the priority pattern you'd pull out? Oh, man. Um, uh, all right. The ones on the list right here. Um, I, I'm going to go with uh, one of the zonker patterns that you'll you'll see here in a moment is just, uh, it's just a go-to. It's, it's a split between that and um, uh, George Daniels uh, sculpt snack, which is basically a, what I call like a really fancy woolly bugger. But between a woolly bugger and a zonker, those are my two. Those are my two favorites. Just can't go wrong. You jump over to that there and see what you got. Yeah. Is that... that is not one of them. So this is just like <laughs> a silk that I was tying up. Big, big eyed weirdo uh, with a zonker tail. Um, go to the next one. 
Yeah. So that guy on the right, it's on the right on my screen, the brown one. Yeah. Uh, that is by far um, one of my most productive uh, streamer streamer fights. It's just it's just a zonker. Um, the secret sauce is I use pine squirrel and not um, rabbit. It's a uh, pine squirrel is a lot softer. You get a get a lot get a lot more action. But uh, yeah. What size yeah, hook are you? Thing, what size hook are you talking about there? Uh, I think that's um, I think it's a uh, an eight, six or an eight, eight, eight. Yeah, it's not big. Um, so one thing I, this this really highlights well is, uh, and I didn't mention this when you're when you're picking flies, even even nymphs uh, or streamers, uh, in particular streamers. Um, I always try to match when the water's clear or clear-ish. I always try to match my streamers to the bed of the of the stream because you think about it, bait fish, they're gonna want to blend in or else they're gonna get munched on, you know, all the time. So they kind of blend in. So your fly should kind of blend in. It's it's um, don't worry about the fish not seeing your fly because it's not the right color. It's in my experience, the streamer, uh, it's the action, it's the movement, it's the pulsing. Um, generally speaking, uh, if you get, if you get the wrong color, like too bright or something really wild, that might scare the fish off. But generally speaking, I try to match my flies to the color at the bottom of the stream. So it's a pro tip for you. All right. So what's the one on the left there then? The left, um, I kind of use that on like, you know, like spring Creek and some of those sandy areas up on spring mm -hmm. Creek, you know what I'm talking about? Like it's kind of mm -hmm. sandy, gravelly, light colored. I use it up there. Um, uh, sometimes I'll throw that uh, when the when the water is kind of um, a, a greener, like it's kind of it's clearing. It's not clear, but it's clearing. Um, or sometimes when uh, the when it's starting to get to low light, it's a little flashier. It's a little brighter. Um, so cool. Yeah. Same same tie though. Same tie. So let's talk about some of the larger streamer patterns. So the bigger streamer patterns, um, you know, you can go with, you know, I'm, I'm talking things that are like three inches and larger, uh, three to four inches long. Uh, they're tied on number four or uh, ot hooks um, or ot sizes hooks. I'm not really good with the hooks that get into the ots. I should be better at it and knowing how big they are. Um, I just know some of my favorite patterns are tied on ot or like double ot hooks. Um, I'll admit I need to, to up my game on the, the hook sizes, but generally speaking, you're going to have a lot more fun throwing these flies. Like, you know, I, you know, you're throwing flies that are, you know, maybe even six inches or four, three, four, six inches, you know, somewhere in that range. You're going to have a lot more fun throwing them with a six or a seven weight, in my opinion, especially if you need to cast them uh, any kind of distance, like from a boat. Um, I love Mike Schmidt's meal ticket. It is, if I could just pick one, one uh, 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 articulated fly to fish, it would be Mike's meal ticket uh, in the, the tan brown or um, the, the tan and uh, brown uh, bicolor. That's another thing with, with streamers that I really like are streamers that are uh, darker on top and lighter on the bottom or like they're different colors. So you could have like olive on top and tan on the bottom. I really like bicolor streamers. I think it adds a little extra um, something to it uh to the fly and then you have uh like the drunken disorderly uh heisenberg which i call the oh, montana yeah, back up a little bit here so what's a drunken disorderly like drunken disorderly is is that that's kelly gallup right i, I i'm gonna get shot by all these uh or i shouldn't say that but i'm gonna be scolded by all these experts for not knowing these these tying guys i think it's kelly gallup right i don't know yeah i don't i don't know either drunken disorderly Man, uh, I have some in my fly box, and I why didn't I bring my fly box up here to show people? That's all right. We're good. But uh, you should Google drunken disorderly fly. Make sure you add fly at the end of that. Um, drunken disorderly fly, <laughs> and um, it's it's a uh, it's got a um, uh, I think it's deer hair head, and it's it's uh, shaved kind of like a square deer head deer hair head. Uh, and it dives and plunges and it gets a lot of really great movement to it. So these sounds like you're talking about these would be better 
for you're saying from a boat oftentimes we're talking about probably bigger water for the most part right i would say bigger water i mean i'm not going to say don't use them on pens creek or the little J. like right definitely use them there um yeah they're probably a little bit more difficult to use on something like uh say like the latour mm -hmm. or um you know i'm trying to even the breach is starting to get a little, a little, yeah, I'm sure you probably could use it on the breach. I'm sure somebody's fished the breaches with a drunken disorderly and absolutely crushed them. But yeah, generally speaking, I think bigger water. Um, but then again, I've also caught like this guy, this fish here came out of a relatively small spring Creek, uh, and attacked a pretty large fly. So, but as you can tell, I'm using a flash. So it was, uh, basically evening uh night time is the right time um yeah so you have zoo cougar and heisenberg as well yeah um, heisenberg uh i put up there because we've used that a lot on uh i believe that's the name of the fly we've used on uh the delaware on the west branch uh pretty often uh this past year and uh I affectionately started calling it the Montana mustache because the fish would come up and it was always like right on their, their nose. And it looked like a, looks like they were wearing a mustache, but it wasn't, it was, it was just a fly that they ate and got stuck with. So it was a little joke. Anyways. <laughs> sorry. Uh, oh, give, us a, give us a little more about, you say many of the modern articulated streamers. So where do articulated streamers come into this? So um, I kind of put that as a catch-all because there's seems like there's always, you know, new patterns that are coming out. But, you know, you look at um, flies that, uh, you know, they're not like a zonker or a, or a bugger. Um, you know, they're not like cone heads. Uh, usually they have like eyes, whether they're stick on or uh, lead eyes. They have like a head of some, some kind, whether it's, uh, you know, like wrapped uh, rabbit uh, fur or, um, you know, deer hair shaped head that will help it to plunge and, and turn certain ways and um you know so there's a lot of different uh modern i guess I, I feel like they're modern i feel like they've really picked up over the last couple years maybe like the last 10 years articulated flies seem to have gotten uh, a lot more popular and uh, you know i think there's a lot of good patterns out there um that are fun to fun to explore um when do you think they're best to use well, this is a great time of the year uh, to, to use them. I uh, generally in the evening is when I really like to use them. Uh, um, I mean, not to say the fish won't chase them in the morning, but you know, if we start to get cooler, cooler nights, fish seem a little bit more sluggish in the morning. Um, so yeah, I generally like using them, you know, as the sun's starting to go down and in, in the evening, uh, as you can see from this fish here yeah you can use them though like uh if you get like an overcast day or i mean god if you get a a storm rolling through and the water starts to come up especially especially in front of uh rising water as bait fish are getting dislodged and and fish start to push to the edges to to get away from the heavy flows um man that's just a great time to fish streamers cool cool tommy lynch thank you tim i'm not good at i should know these people tim bennett just put in the chat that uh according to google the dnd &D is a tommy lynch so yes um i think zoo cougar is kelly gallup and i should know this but i i'm i'm just uh not as up on the it's okay Derek, we, we can move on we don't you don't have to feel bad about knowing no let me apologize for five more minutes <laughs> uh all right cool well, let's take a look at uh oh, here's a comment from you which i agree with is you know taking a look at the fall and don't, don't forget to enjoy the show so yeah yeah that's, yeah, that's i this is the the little j and um fall is just like a great time of year that it's it's intense fishing but you know don't don't um don't forget to take a, a moment and uh and just take it all in because it's it's pretty cool pretty cool out there and take take some pictures that maybe aren't just fish anyways there's there's my <laughs> two seconds 
All right, let's talk about some seasonal hatches and trout food. What do you got for us? Yeah, yep. So I'll admit, um, this is pretty spot on. I've never been a real trico fisherman guy, although I really want to try it now that I'm like getting more confident in my, uh, in my smaller flies. But um, this is a little bit from my experience, but also I'm not going to lie. I went back through my stack of uh, mid-Atlantic fly fishing guide articles that I saved from when that glorious magazine was still around. And, and these are a lot of the uh, dry fly um, uh, hatches that, that, they uh, recommend from across the state. And uh, this is this is my experience. I love the October caddis hatch. Was up on the cinema honing uh, years ago and we had some nice action on the October caddis and um, Isonychia, which um, I don't know, maybe I spelled that wrong, but that, that word there below October caddis is Isonychia. And that is actually uh, the slate drake. Um, and it's kind of like a brownish reddish uh, larger fly, as you can see, and um, it's a nice, nice evening fly. Um, October caddis, uh, you know, afternoon, evening. Um, olives can happen anytime uh, during the day, especially if you have overcast conditions. Trichos, from what I understand, are mostly a morning thing, right, Dave? Like I said, I'm not a big trico guy, but understand that's more of a, a morning thing caddis you can have the the, the tan black green caddis you can have those uh kind of in the morning as well you know those at any time um you you still might find some sulfurs around you know depending on where you're fishing um and then midges are kind of just a an any any time uh situation cool What do you, going back to that though, what's do you think the most predominant hatch you're going to encounter? I mean, be prepared for. Uh, man, it's just probably because I love that it's so reliable is olives, blue winged olives. Yeah. I just, I mean, that's just such a reliable hatch on so many of the streams that I go to that. And uh, I mean, here's the thing too. If you have a parachute Adams, <laughs> you, you, you could, you could realistically with a parachute Adams fly, you could, imitate I agree a good many of some of those those uh those bugs well you you definitely can do the slate trade because that's a pretty close pattern to that one if you got especially if you got a big a big a big atoms on that but certainly you know you all, else, all else fails throw an atoms out there yeah and actually so that's i, I don't want to go too long How, where are we at with time all right yeah better hurry this up but long story short we were on uh we were on a pretty picky river one time and we were throwing all the patterns that we were told to have these real precise patterns that we bought at the at the fly shop you know that day and um the fish just must have seen millions and millions of millions of these imitations and so finally instead of getting more specific we actually said what if we get more general and voila the the parachute atoms came through so um you know extra points for be the generalist don't be afraid to be a generalist anyways cool. yep no, i agree with that Cool, wet flies, nymphs, probably pretty important. Yeah, yeah. So um, real reliable. Uh, I forget what's that saying that everybody kind of throws around, like uh, ninety percent of what a trout eats is underwater or something like that. Uh, I don't know. I, I hear like all sorts of kind of sayings that get floated around out there, something like that. Fish eat a lot of trout eat a lot of stuff that's underwater, and uh, here's some of the stuff that that you should have with you, like a pheasant tail, hares ear, prince nymph. Uh, I always keep some on me that are in sizes 14, 16, 18. So that dash there is meant to say, keep flies on you from 14 to 18. Uh, crest bugs and scuds, which one of my personal favorite patterns that I tie up is that uh, fly right there that you see in the lower right hand corner. That's one of my uh, scudus sow worms, kind of looks a little bit like a lot of different things. Um, caddis larva. Uh, obviously we'll be floating around midges um, zebra midges work great they work great as droppers so if you have that uh, atoms you know like say you're fishing a 14 atoms and you want to do a little dry dropper action tie a zebra midge on there um, stonefly nymphs you know they're starting to get moving around a little bit you know so that's not a bad thing to bounce along the bottom deep um, and then euro nymphing patterns like uh, frenchies and uh, forgot all the other names i used to know all the names. Paradins. 
Paradigms. Yeah, Paradigons, Paradigms. Paradigms, yeah. Yeah. All of those really awesome flies that people, crazy awesome flies that people are tying. And there's so many out there. Um, but, you know, their deep searching patterns uh, for those deep runs are going to be, are going to be good. Um, and then you got your garden hackle, you know, don't forget your garden hackle. So uh, San Juan worms, green weenies, mop flies, um, other garden hackle, debauch, botchery, um, you know, make sure you have them. And then of course, eggs, because uh, fish, you know, fish are trout are going to be spawning. So there's going to be eggs in the system and uh, rainbows love eggs all year long. So you should have them with you. Uh, what color eggs do you prefer? <sighs> really? I don't know. Um, I mean, like, uh, apparently eggs change color depending on uh, whether, they, whether they were fertilized or not and temperature. And um, uh, so gen generally speaking, my, my favorite colored eggs are uh, peach colored. And uh, there's like this weird purple that I didn't learn the name of that color in art school, but it's like a peach purple. It's not peach, but it's like peach and purple together. Those are my two favorite colors. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll have to remember that purple one. I'll have to look it up. It's like uh, pea purple, <laughs> chirple, but chirple, I think. Purple. Yeah, that's the one. Okay. Purple. Yeah. Um, so terrestrials often overlooked and uh, at your own peril overlooked terrestrials but ants beetles i'm not going to read the slide because i was taught not to read the slides and i've been reading all these slides so you can read the slide um you should have terrestrials with you also terrestrials make really great uh dries uh to your dry dropper setup uh because a lot of them are big um griffith snat also really underrated generalist pattern love the griffith snat uh has come in clutch for me many a times uh when we were trying to precisely match a hatch and we couldn't quite figure it out uh and we're trying to get too too precise and then we just threw you know a tiny 18 griffith snat out there and you know maybe they thought it was an ant or something i don't know but ants flying ants you're gonna see uh flying orange ants flying brown ants flying black ants you're gonna have those so and then um, I consider mice, moles, voles, rodents to be terrestrial critters. And uh, I just had a friend of mine who was out on a local Spring Creek last night who had a really nice blow up on a mouse. So that's still not over. Uh, just because it's not summer anymore doesn't mean you can't throw a mouse out there. So fuchsia. Um, yeah, I'm going to say fuchsia was the, the color. Is fuchsia Thanks, Adam. <laughs> purple and pink. I'm gonna have to look that up. Funny. It very well might be fuchsia. I don't think I, I don't think a grown man should say that out in a you know in a tackle shop. Do you have any fuchsia? Uh, so out. just to add to what you're saying, I, I had some fantastic afternoons and yellow breeches, for example, overcast days with just you know bright orange ants. You know, just casting those out by the, along the banks and stuff like that. And just, you know, for no reason, nothing would happen for a while. And all of a sudden, I left it on there. And like, all of a sudden, around 2.30, they decided to take the, you know, the, the bright orange red ants, you know, and just boom, 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 boom. It's just one of those weird ones. Like, you know, nothing else is working. I, I often say, you know, if, if like, so if you're, if you're out there and the streamers aren't working and you don't see any hatches coming off and the nymphs aren't working is, yeah, just go to terrestrials. Um, yeah. it's been my luck just to sort of change it all up when you're just going on, I mean, especially when you're frustrated with not much is happening, what, what you're expecting to have happen. So it's just sort of changing things up and knowing where, where an ant might be coming in at or a beetle or, or something, a cricket or something like that, thinking about they'll be closer to the bank and letting them or underneath a tree, which is another really or good the one. dead tree. Right. Which Henry Ramsey changed my life with, um, you know, in his presentation about terrestrials, he was talking about looking for dead trees. Mm -hmm. That's why I threw that picture in there. It's, um, of course, of course, it's going to be covered in ants and all sorts of other goodness, and the trout know it. And the more I started to look for it, the more I started to notice, wow, yes, dead trees. Yeah, I see that one, Tim. Got your idea on the orange ant is a, the, the pattern of the crane fly rather than the ant. It's hard to say. Oh, yeah. Interesting. 
I know that the uh, the orange ant is legendary on on the yellow breaches. I've heard several people yeah. comment on it, and uh, that's that's always fun. What Sorry. if they think it's a pellet? Hmm. Oh, I should shouldn't say that. It's a pellet. Come on, streamers, oh. what do you got? All right. Um, oh man, this this slide got really bunched up. I'm so sorry. Um, so just going with uh, the buggers, right? Buggers are awesome. They're so versatile. You can tie buggers in so many different um, different styles. You can add legs. You can not have legs. You can have cones. You can have beads. You can, I mean, you can do all sorts of stuff with the with the woolly bugger. It's just a great pattern. Uh, I like pattern uh, woolly buggers from size six to size uh, twelve. Um, you can see those purple ones right there. Those, that's an example of the bicolor that I was talking about, um, where you have like, a, I'm going to say that's like a maroon on one side and a, a crystal purple on the other. Um, I personally like what George Daniel does with his sculpt snack. It's a tan on one, uh, one like the top or the bottom, I should say, tan on the bottom, olive on the top. Um, you can not put beads on them. You could weight them. You could not weight them. Uh, you can do all sorts of stuff with, uh, with, uh, uh, woolly buggers and streamers. Um, see here. Oh yeah. Uh, in particular with, uh, George Daniel's sculpt snack, uh, I like to dead drift it. It's, it's a weighted, it's a weighted, uh, cone head, uh, uh, pattern, uh, at least the way that I tie it. And, um, uh, I was watching George do a presentation on, on a video somewhere and uh, I watched him. He actually used it as a nymph. So it's super versatile. You can, you can strip it, uh, you can jig it, or you can dead drift it. And it works all the different ways. So just a really versatile pattern. Cool. And then, um, so the, see the brown zonkers on the left? Uh, that's that's the the final the most recent evolution of that uh, zonker pattern that I said I really love. That's the most re recent iteration that I've been working with. So you can see I have added some flash in there, some other stuff. Um, but anyway, zonkers similar to buggers. You can tie them with the hook up or the hook down. So sometimes people put it with the uh, the hook going up through the tail. Sometimes people tie it with the hook going down underneath the tail. Um, you can have cone heads. You can have like uh, the guy on the right there. Uh, where I tied it with a um, big heavy dumbbell eye. Um, sometimes I think it's, they, they target seeing that eye that helps to draw them in. Um, and then also you can see with that, uh, that green and tan one that kind of tried to do that like bicolor uh, idea again there. Um, but all about that action, all about that, that tail twitching um, gives a lot of, gives a lot of movement, makes the fish angry. And then uh, big streamers. So you can see that big honking. That's a game changer. Uh, I believe that was, the, I believe that's a game changer. I, maybe they don't call that a game changer. It's, it's tied on those um, articulated fish spine uh, janglies nowadays. Are, are all flies that are tied on them called game changers, Dave? Do you know? Uh, I do not know that. I don't know. But someone, someone did a really nice job of tying that fly. Um, I actually found that at the library on the Tully. And yes, I left it because I thought, <laughs> you know what? Uh, someone, someone was gonna have a really good time on there. But um, you can see that fly, here's my hand. So it was probably, I don't know, what is that? Four inches? Yeah. So it's probably four inches long. Um, big mean flies, big mean fish. Um, you see two big mean fish that I caught down here in Southeastern PA. Um, on big mean flies and Mike's meal ticket, drunk and disorderly, Heisenberg, um, Hawkins uh, triple double, which is not an articulated, but it is a big single hook fly. And then Schultz's sculpin, um, I guess they call it Schultz's S4 sculpin. Uh, that's an articulated fly as well. But cool, very good. Let's let's jump over to a little bit of um, where where to go. Okay. So that's probably as much as anybody's, you know, kind of next thing is looking, you know, where, where can they go to, and then where should they be thinking about going um, to be fly fishing? So let's just jump over to, we have the uh, Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission map here. Um, and jump in here with me as you want there, um, Derek. 
I wanted to bring up this part of the website from the PA Fish and Boat Commission. This was a, a starting point for us to sort of talk about it. If anyone hasn't been there, I use this all the time. I mean, it's probably one of my favorite parts of the website there, the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. Um, um, it may draw up a little slow here for us, so please bear with me as I'm going through some of this. But, you know, one of the challenges of, of I think, when you move from into fall and also when you move into winter is where can you go? You become a little more limited. Um, certainly, you know, spring and, and summer, you have the choices of all your waterways. Um, but, you know, I think that there's some plenty of good opportunities outside your normal stocked areas. You know, so your stock streams uh, are going to kind of lose a lot of what they had maybe during the summertime because of the hot, the freestone waters, the temperatures are going to get too high, trout are going to get taken and or the water temperatures are just going to, you know, eliminate them at that point as well. There's a lot of holdovers. And where do you think, um, um, where, where do you think, Derek, when you're scouting out a spot, where are some of the bigger, what are the areas you'd like to be going to? What are you thinking about? Um, well, you know, I don't know. I've been on a kick of just trying to find uh, newer water. Um, I mean, obviously, you can read the books, the Keystone Fly Fishing book. Um, you know, this is a great one. If you don't have it, uh, get it. This is a really good one. Um, there's a couple other books, but um, when I'm thinking of uh, when I'm when I'm looking for new water, which is kind of what I've been trying to do lately. Um, I click on the, uh, the class A trout stream uh, mm -hmm. layer um, and then I click on the natural reproduction layer and I look at where do I see uh, lots of green and blue uh, watersheds coming together um, and, and where do I see like larger uh, uh, watersheds uh, that have a lot of, like I said, the, those green and those blue lines. Um, and then I start to think about where can I get public access to in those watersheds. Um, and then I might look at Google Maps and, you know, check out, you know, what's the forest cover look like, things like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So like, well, I used to use a lot of the um, fall stocking streams as places to go. Um, but I think over the last eight years, um, the Fish Commission has really dialed back the amount of fish they're putting in those streams and limiting the number of streams that they're actually putting them in as well. Um, even that's right. You asked about stocking. You asked about holdovers, right? I missed that. Well, yeah, I mean, that's part of what some people like to do. Not everybody's looking for wild trout. You know, right. so people are still looking for where can they get uh, something that may be stocked, something more plentiful. And, um, you know, you're, you're not going to have as many options from stock uh, streams. And the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission published, uh, and they did about a month ago, and again, on their website, um, a stocking list of all the streams and lakes that they're going to um, put fish in. And I don't know the exact numbers. They actually never post the numbers per se anymore, but they're greatly reduced. I mean, they used to be large numbers. I mean, they're, they're stocking like Pine Creek, for example. And you kind of go, it's a pretty big water. I don't imagine they're stocking, you know, hundreds of thousands of fish on Pine Creek. Who knows how many they're stocking and where, but it's not a lot. But Pine Creek in itself is a great waterway that holds a lot of water year round anyway. So yeah, it's a place that you kind of go, I'm not worried about the stocking there. But my point of using a resource like this from um, the Fish and Boat Commission is, is stockings, I think, is a little less relevant anymore. Um, it used to be kind of important for fall fishing. If you wanted to look for stockfish, I think you're still going back to some of the, um, I'd say the more special regulation streams in certain regions are going to be pretty good for you. I'll take these other ones off. Um, if you're looking for stock streams, uh, so special regulation areas are, are going to have, and, and Penn's Creek is a special regulation area, for example. Um, Spring Creek is a special reg area, but they also have wild and naturally producing trout in them too. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of waterways that have mixed kind of combinations of some really good places to go. There's also some pretty tough water too. I mean, Penn's Creek is not an easy place to fish uh, any time of the year, uh, but it's a beautiful place to go to in the fall. Um, it's not as crowded as in the fall as you might find in the spring. Little Junietta is the same way. So the, the big three up around State College area are, are Little Junietta, Penn's Creek, and um, Spring Creek. But as you can see with this, this blue area, there's plenty of other spring, nice, nice water, especially in the southern part South central part of the state uh, that has plenty of really good waters to go to. 
Um, I mean, I'm not spot burning here because these are all publicly known waters, but Big Spring Creek, Latorte. Um, and again, they're fun waters to go to, but they're not easy. Yellow breaches. Um, they're all good fishing areas that are going to have uh, trout in them year round for you to go to, especially in the fall. Um, and I think generally, if you really want to get a little more specialized, you, you, you're doing some of the things like going to some of these class A trout streams uh, at the top um, and then moving into some of the more, um, maybe if you want to go like some blue lining, which would be just basically brook trout fishing, some of the smaller, um, smaller waters and stuff like that too is fun to go into. Yeah, the wilderness trout streams are really neat. So that's a classification where uh, they have to be surrounded by like X amount of forest and be like so much remote and uh, only so much improved. And so you can see there's really not that many of them. And uh, those make for some really cool, um, cool opportunities as well. Um, you know, you just want to make sure if you're going back in there, people know where you are or, you know, someone knows where you are. And when you're supposed to be coming back and, you know, kind of make those proper, but, uh, yeah. yeah, most of those are all up in the Northern part of the central part of the state. Um, the Keystone streams are pretty good too. They don't stock a lot of those, but there are some, they usually, you know, if you're not familiar with the Keystone streams, those are specially selected streams throughout the state that will have a little bit more fish and larger trout stocked in them during the springtime, especially and some of the streams will even have fall stockings as well, but not all of them. Um, and then also these other trout streams have natural reproducing trout are usually smaller, less, more obscure streams. But there's, you know, again, up in the north part of the state, there's lots of them. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of them up there. You won't find them as much around the city areas or urban areas and stuff like that. But there's a lot of them there. there. So I encourage you to go to this site if you're looking for places to go. There's a lot of common streams and, and, and places to hit. Excuse me, those easy and obvious ones are the special regulation streams. There's a lot of them. I just flipped over to them right now. And they're, like I said, Penn's Creek, Yellow Creek, um, Spring Creek, central part of the state. And there's, there's a lot of other places. I don't fish up in the Northeast at all, Lackawanna and things like that, or I don't fish too often down uh, in the Southwest part of the state. But, um, you know, if those are your areas, they're easy to find. The central part of this, this state has just boatloads of places to go to, and it's hard not to find a good stream to try out. And part of it says I encourage people to, you know, on, the, on my website, PA Fly Fish, you can look in there or talk to people about where you're trying to get to. And you can look at other people posting where they've been and where they've caught fish. And you use that as a resource for yourself. And I think also, like Derek said, that book, Keystone. Uh, Charlie Mack had several books he produced. There's plenty of good resources online if you're willing to kind of go out and try some new spots. I make an effort every year to go to someplace different at least a few times during the year. I just went up to Little Pine Creek um, up near Lycoming County and um, had a really nice time up there. I was up there by myself, rented a cabin at Little Pine State Park, and then went brookie fishing. Um, I like to do photography, so I was up there I actually found a couple of really good restaurants, believe it or not. I was like pretty shocked how good the restaurants were. Then they weren't open Tuesday and Wednesday evening. So I was cooking on my own those nights. But on Thursday night, I found a fantastic restaurant at Happy Acres Campground, believe it or not. And I was like, you know, who that is Tim, you ever been there? Yeah. I was like, I couldn't believe how good the, there was like, a, they had like chicken and tortellini with spinach. I was like, no way. And then they had a a great selection of beer and wine so you know it's good i mean the fall is a great place to go out and just try some different things i mean the, the big name streams that you may have heard about are great places to go and i encourage you to try those out but also to try some other stuff out as well and if you're looking and not sure about a place to go as i said you know checking out pa fly fish may be a good way for you to ask some people about not only where you can go in that county or that region but also there's a thread going about great dives joints and places you can eat food too. So you can check that as well. Um, and Chris, yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, you mentioned about the Northwest steelhead streams in Erie County. There's a lot going on up there. That's certainly a, a big and unique activity that uh, takes place. And Derek, do you guide up there for any of that or do any of that? I don't, I don't guide up there. I go up uh, for myself to have fun. Um, I, I saw some pictures from today. Some guys were at the tubes on elk and uh, 
looks really low and clear but there's some fish in there for sure chris you uh, want to you can you can take yourself off mute chris yeah hey i live up here in erie and uh the, the fish are coming in we're supposed to get some rain tonight so this weekend yeah, should be right. hot that's good yeah and chris up, mostly bro. i've only been up there a few times doing it but the general call is when, it, when the water is rising or the water is lowing, coming down, which when, when the, the rain conditions are, the, are the, the, the best thing that can happen for fishing underneath those conditions. Is that right? Correct. As the water is going up oh, is what okay. we like to go. Cool. Um, it all depends. It depends on the time of the year. If it's more in the, in the winter, you'd want to go when it's, it's starting to really starting to decrease because the water will start warming up actually versus being cold as a snow melt but uh those are some keys yeah and so so for erie fishing that's that's now through early january isn't it as long as uh, actually up through april april, april. Okay. yeah don't like chris brings up a great point i went up in april a few times and you have a shot at not only catching some nice drop back uh steelhead uh, even maybe some chrome, but um, Chris, do you ever get into the the big uh, the bass coming in at all? That's more toward May at the okay. lower ends of the streams. Um, higher up, you can still get some steelhead. The manistee come in toward uh, late February, March, and they kind of stay up there for a while. Yeah, we were fishing the mouth of elk in, uh, I, I think it was like, uh, it was April sometime, I'm pretty sure. And uh, all of a sudden, we saw these bronze, uh, these smallmouth coming in. My buddy got into some real nice smallmouth down there at the mouth of elk. Yeah, it's incredible with the smallmouth in the spring. Um, you could be surprised how big they are. Um, yeah. Many years ago, I, I swear I got the state record um, <laughs> on a bad trout opener when the water was just nasty up here. We were at the mouth of Elk Creek fishing the lake and we caught one. It was, it was a screamer. It must have been about 26, 27 inches long. Whoa. It was awesome. huge. That's That's awesome. Great. Uh, another one that I think Paul asked about Tribs stocked and non-stocked, uh, the large river systems like the Allegheny, Clarion, Yacht, and Delaware. Um, those are great places for movement. Exactly. And I think kind of Derek was alluding to some of that earlier. A lot of the, the trout are going to be moving back and forth out of the bigger waters, even out of Pine Creek. Take example, say, take example of something like Pine Creek, which is up in North Central Pennsylvania. Those bigger trout are going to move into some smaller tributaries to spawn oftentimes. Um, and so, but that doesn't mean the fishing in those, those big waters aren't, isn't good as well though. Um, and then I, I really highly encourage those of you that can or think it's the right thing to do or you know just figure out a way to make it work for yourself if you're going to hit some of those bigger waters there are good places to be um but get a guide for yourself and, and get on the water with some sort of watercraft and have somebody give you a hand getting started some of those bigger waters are um best served by being in a in a, in a boat of some type um and getting yourself around with someone who knows what's going on there and can have the right uh, setups for you as well um i've been in the delaware in the fall and it can be hit or miss, you know, like depending on whether or not they're releasing from the bottom of the dam. So I was on the West Branch a couple of years ago, and it was the week before was fantastic. The week I got there and they released, bottom released out of the dam and it was just mud and we had no luck at all. So it can be hit or miss depending on the streams that you're the water that you're going to. But I highly encourage that you, um, you know, check in with a guide when you can on some of these areas i mean certainly we all like and enjoy and pride ourselves and being able to kind of get out there on our own and do some stuff but um you know derek's a guide um there's a lot of folks out there that are some really good guides and if you're looking for somebody or you need some help with somebody in a certain area uh, i know derek could probably help you out if he can't do it for you he'd probably direct you to somebody that might be able to help you out and i, I do encourage you to take advantage of that i mean I don't use them very often. I certainly, if I'm going out West, I'm going to take a guide for a day or two. It just makes sense for me to not think I can have five or seven days of fishing that I'm going to know exactly what I want to do the whole time. So I think it's a, a, an important uh, resource for you to lean on, especially in uh, areas that are a little more complicated or sophisticated that you may not be familiar with um, along those areas. Um, we're getting close to wrapping up. Do we have any more questions? 
I'll say to the guide point really quick too. Sure. Um, not only are you going to learn a lot about that particular area, wherever, uh, wherever you're, you're taking, uh, hiring a guide for, but um, I hire guides as much as I possibly can, because I learn so much from how watching them fish. I, I, I try to um, get guys to, to fish and I like to just watch them because everybody fishes a little bit differently. And even if you don't take a guide, maybe try to find someone who's local or experienced um, and, take a second and just watch how they approach things, you know, and, and, and at the very least, um, if you don't have a great day catching, um, maybe you'll, you'll learn or you'll take away some things to, to think about. And, and that can be worth it in and of itself. Cool. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up here. It's just about eight o'clock and I said, we'd, we'd get done at that point. Uh, I'd like to thank Derek uh, a lot for your time and, and really appreciate you sharing with us uh, your knowledge and some of the ideas that you have on some of this. Um, this last slide here on the screen is some ways to reach out to Derek. Uh, you can get a hold of him at keystoneflyguides at gmail.com. Um, his website is Sky Blue Outfitters. Um, as I mentioned, my, my website, that's actually, that's Rick Niles. That's, that's Rick's. I'm sorry, that's Rick's. Yeah. Yeah. But it, that's if, if you want to uh, book me, uh, or book a trip, uh, I would send you to skybueoutfitters.com. And again, my name is Dave Kyle. Pretty easy to find. Um, Dave at PA Flyfish. Uh, website is paflyfish.com. Been around for 25 years. So I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us tonight. I uh, hope we will run through some more here on occasion. Uh, anybody has any other ideas or topics would like to share them with me? All, all ears to hear what you want to get presented uh, to you and some other on other topics. And uh, I want to thank you all for your time this evening. Take care. Thanks, everyone.